All right, so just want to welcome everyone in person online and just uh, want to explain what we're going to be doing today is um, we, we were praying on Wednesday and the elders felt like, okay, there's still some more things we need to work on before doing communion. And so we, we all three, we all, well, all six of us witnessed with that, that, okay, God, you, you're, you're speaking to something to us about divine order still. And we felt like, okay, we need to push pause on taking communion and, and just, just believe that God was saying to us, there, there's something about divine order that's still required. So I'm going to teach about divine order in the church. And um, if you remember about two weeks ago, I talked about divine order and I listed out several different things. You know, divine order is very, very important. A lot of people don't understand divine order, but divine order begins, like I was just praying, divine order begins with the lordship of Jesus Christ. If we, don't have the Lord, if we don't have true, authentic lordship to Jesus Christ, there is no divine order in the house, in the family, in the church, in our personal lives, in civil authority, in civil, in civil government. There is no divine order. But divine order begins in the, with the lordship of Jesus Christ. And I re just remind you that Jesus told people, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not obey what I tell you? <clears throat> and... You know, we, we, can, we can say he's Lord with our lips, but if our actions are not carried out in obedience, then is he really Lord? I would say no, he's not. He, he must be Lord of all. He must be Lord of all. And so divine order begins <clears throat> in the heart when we come under, the, under to, to submission to Jesus Christ. Then after that, there's, a, there's divine order in the spirit-led life. God is, or Paul was very clear in the book of Romans. He said, you are under obligation, brethren, to no longer live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But you must, you must put to death the deeds of the body so that you will live. Divine order in the spirit-led life. Where it, it is spirit first. Not your body first, not your soul first, not how you feel, not what you think. Not what you want, not what your body craves, no. Divine order in the spirit-led life is about, it comes from your union with Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. The, the, the very spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is now joined to your human spirit if you're born again. That is an amazing reality. And so the problem is most Christians still live by what they think, what they feel, what they want, what their body craves, instead of living from this union of the Spirit of God joined to the human spirit, living from that spirit first, Lord, what do you want? What do you want to do? What do you want to do it? What do you want to say? Soul second, bringing the thought, the, the will, and the emotions under the, the leading of the Spirit, body third. That's the, that's the Spirit-led life in divine order, marriage. That then flows into marriage. If you, if you don't, you will never have true divine order in your marriage until there's lordship to Christ in both the husband and wife, until there's a spirit-led life in both the husband and wife. Then comes marriage in Ephesians 5, through 23, where, the, where Paul says, husbands, it begins with the husband. It does not begin with the wife. Husbands, it does not begin with woman submit to me. It begins with the man saying, I'm laying down my life for you in sacrifice. And I shared, you know, a couple Sundays ago how I made the ultimate mistake when we first got married. I'll just, if you weren't here, I'll just share it just real quickly where God was, was speaking some things to me that he wasn't, I mean, maybe perhaps Angie wasn't hearing or maybe more accurately didn't really want to hear. And she would agree with that. Um, and so the Lord spoke very, very clear to me about these things. You know, basically the Lord was telling me, I must serve my dad in ministry. This is right after we got married in the nine, or late 90s. And I knew the Lord was saying, you must serve your dad in ministry. And I knew that. And Angie was trying to make God say that, not say that. And so anyway, I was, we were in this conversation and it was, you know, heated, I would say, like, uh, to say it nicely. It was heated. Um, and uh, you, it's hard to even imagine that Angie would have heated words because she's so sweet. Um, but it was heated. It was heated. And, you know, she said some things to me that triggered me. I said some things that triggered her. That was over 25 years ago. But the point was, as I said to her, God, and I was probably one of the, you know, you've been in those arguments with your wife or your husband. And you said, God said to Adam, not to Eve. God said to Abraham, not to Sarah. 
You need to submit to your husband. And they're, okay, please don't ever do that. Okay, do not ever do that. That is an absolute uh, gateway to failure in a marriage. So that is not biblical submission at all. Biblical submission begins with the husband laying down his life in sacrifice as the spiritual leader. And if that is not happening, there is no divine order in terms of submission. Submission follows after the husband being the spiritual leader, laying down his life, sacrificing his life, loving her like Christ loved the church, which means self-sacrifice, love, and, and you know, getting the mind of Christ. That's, that's when divine order begins to happen. Parenting, I mentioned that. Uh, church government, elders are to uh, govern the church, and I'm going I'm to drill into that. That's going to be the focus of this teaching today, so I'm not going to uh, elaborate on there. Then civil authority, that's Romans chapter 13. We'll not go into that in this message. So anyway, today I want to talk about divine order in the church uh, through elders. Okay, so a lot of people don't know about this, and um, so I, I just want to I want to dr I want to drill into this a little bit further to do some teaching on that, and it's it's really really interesting. This is really like when the Lord opened this. You know, you're reading your scripture sometimes, and just all of a sudden the something comes alive on the page, or more accurately on the tablet for me because I read on this iPad mainly because my eyes are not good, but uh, my reading eyes are not good. But anyway, I was reading through First Corinthians chapter 11, and I never saw this before. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in my Bible, it, there's a heading on there that says uh, Christian order in, at the beginning of the chapter. And then, I don't know, 10 verses down, 15 verses down, the, the second heading, it says the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> and when I was reading that, I was like, wow, I really felt like, Lord, you are speaking to us right now out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And did you know this? I mean, you may not know this, but when Sam Sullivan was here back in April, he said to us, to, he gave us 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I didn't even know that until I went back and read the transcripts of his message. He said, the, the Lord's given you uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's a word for restoration life. Then when Terry comes and he shares what he shares, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, God was really telling us, okay, for you, restoration life, you are at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That divine order must precede the Lord's Supper. Okay? Divine order, that begins in all areas that I've just listed. Divine order precedes the Lord's Supper in terms of the Lordship of Christ, in terms of the Spirit-led life, in terms of the marriage and parenting in terms of the church, in terms of civil authority, that divine order begins, or divine order is the must precede communion. That's what I believe the Lord is saying. That's one of the reasons why I felt the need to pause on communion and teach on divine order in the church because I really think that, I don't think a lot of people understand from Scripture about the role of elders and church government and things like that. And so we need to unpack these things so we can understand it. <clears throat> so so that, that's where we're going today is God governs the church through uh, multiple elders who have equal authority. God does not uh, lead or govern the church by one man. Listen to this. That was the Old Testament. God does not lead the church by a Moses who is the only one going up on the mountain to hear from God and coming back down and saying, the Lord said, you follow, now you, everyone else follow me, all right? That's Old Testament. New Testament is through elders, okay? New, New Testament is through a, now you got to have the right elders or it could be a mess because if you don't have the right elders, that's a whole other story. But thank God we have good elders here and I'm not, I'm talking about Randall and my dad, um, Angie, do you think I'm okay? I'm okay. Okay, I'm okay. But Randall and Dad, I trust. Um, but the New Testament model of leadership is not Moses go up on the mountain, hear from God, and then come back down off the mountain and tell everyone, this is what God has said, follow me. That in the New Testament can get you into some serious trouble, especially right now, if you know, God is highlighting spiritual abuse in the church where leaders have abused their authority. 
And I believe a lot of that is rooted in the fact they don't have the New Testament biblical governmental model through a body of elders who have equal authority. Again, it depends on having the right elders because if you don't have the right elders, it will not function, it will not work well. But it's through, it's through a body of elders that we all are coming to get the mind of the Lord together and that we're, we're coming to get the mind of the Lord together and then we're leading together. So at Restoration Life, we are an elder governed church. Um, I am fully submitted to Dad and Randall. Dad is fully submitted to Randall and me, and Randall is fully submitted to Dad and myself. We are, we're, it's kind of like the Trinity, we're, but we're very far from being like Christ. But <laughs> Dad and, Dad's probably the most Christ-like of us all, but, you know, he's older, so we'll give him that, okay? But <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is, is I'm not up here as the only one who is the supreme authority. Even though I'm the primary teacher, the church is governed by three elders and our wives who work along with us. So it's, it's through this, this multiple leadership of elders that God governs the church. All right? So that's the way, that's the way rest, restoration life is set up. Now, just want to give a disclaimer here. As I get into this teaching about, about uh, spiritual authority in the church, the elders, the way the, elder, the way the scriptures teach about elders in the church and governing in the church, I want to give a, an honest disclaimer here that I am fully aware right now of God exposing abusive leadership in the church. God, and if you've, been, if you've been in a cave or something, you may not know this, but if you, if you see what's going on, I mean, God himself. He is coming to judge the church, and he's judging leaders right now first. Now, he's also judging the whole church, but leaders he's exposing, and God is exposing abusive leadership in his house. And I'll be real honest. I'm just going to be honest with you. I really procrastinated. I felt the leading of the Lord to teach about divine order in the church, but I, I really procrastinated about that. I didn't want to teach about that. I knew it's like, okay, this is about the worst. This is, I don't, the only thing that I can think that's worse timing than preaching on divine order in the church right now is dad's Mother's Day message uh, when he first preached Mother's Day. When he, he, it was Mother's Day, and I remember Teresa was her first Mother's Day. She was so happy and so excited. Sorry, dad. <clears throat> it's going gonna, it's gonna to go, I mean, it, we're going to be talking about this throughout eternity. But, <laughs> Much, the first Mother's Day message Dad ever preached was entitled Controlling Women and the Spirit of Jezebel. <laughs> so, now he would never do that again, I don't think. But, no, he would not. He would not. He'd ne and we gave him such a hard time. It was like, that's before, our, that's, that's before the elders were really doing our job. Okay, so I'll take some responsibility in that. But instead of giving the mothers flowers for Mother's Day, we, had, we were doing a deliverance session casting out the Spirit of Jezebel. Okay? So, that's bad timing, and I felt like, okay, this message just feels like such bad timing right now. Here it is. God is exposing abusive leadership in the church. God's exposing, I mean, you just think about IHOP and Mike Bickle and what's happening in Morningstar, what's happening even in the Reformed church, even in Calvinistic circles. It just, it just seems like God's moving in his church to purify, and he's starting with leadership. And it's just like, this is like the worst time in the world to talk about divine order. I mean, so I just want to say that that was one of the reasons I really, really hesitated to, to say that. It was like, okay, this is bad timing, really bad timing. So anyway, that was one of the reasons. Another reason I was really reluctant to teach on that is I don't want it to come across. I learned my lesson in marriage that you don't say, woman, submit to me, all right? And so I did not want this to come across to you like, church, submit to me or submit to us. That is not my heart at all. This is not like some insecure, power-hungry leader coming up here and saying, I'm going to manipulate Scripture so you will submit to me. And that's another reason I was like, I don't, I mean, it's awkward. If I went into another church and taught on divine order, that would be fine. But doing it in your own church is awkward, okay? I'm just going to tell you it's really awkward. I, I don't, I just said, Lord, I don't want to teach on this. And the Lord just kept saying, no. You need to do it. You need to do it. You need to do it. I was like, okay, we're doing it. I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm an authoritarian leader trying to control you. That's the furthest thing from my heart. So 
I'm, I'm very, very sensitive to this whole issue of abusive authority that's taking place in the church. I think I have listened. I felt like I needed to. I feel like I've listened to every podcast almost that's been released about the Mike Bickle IHOP scandal because Mike Bickle was a mentor to me from afar. I'd never met him. Um, but he was a mentor to me from afar, and I was thinking, I just wanted to see, okay, what, what of his teaching do I need to repent of? What of his teaching did I say, okay, did I embrace that I need to make sure it was bad, faulty teaching? Now, a lot of his stuff was, it was excellent and still is excellent. I'm not going to get into all that right now. But my main point was this. I wanted to examine my heart, and I still am. Lord, is there anything in me that's abusive? Okay, is there anything in me that, that is, as you're exposing abusive leaders, is there anything in me? And I know Randall and I know Dad and all, we're, we're searching our hearts because we want to be true, genuine shepherds in the fear of the Lord that have the Lord Jesus Christ shepherd's heart. That's really our heart, okay? We're not perfect by any means, but, but that is our heart. And so we were examining ourselves thinking, okay, Lord, okay, just show us if there's anything we need to repent of uh, in this season because we, we realize, okay, God is exposing abusive leadership in the church. Okay. And, and let me just say this, just thinking about abusive leadership, I'll say this. Abusive leadership in the church thrives, this is very important, when a church or an organization does not operate in the New Testament model of church governance led by elders, okay? That's where abusive leadership thrives. That was the error of Mike Bickle, is he did not operate by... by by a biblical model of eldership, he got basically yes men that he could control and manipulate, and they basically were uh, groomed to do whatever he said and to go along with that agenda. So if, if you want to look at the very root of most abusive leadership in the church, it's because there is not the right, correct government in place, all right? The biblical model is governed through elders, plural, not elder, not one man, elders. <clears throat> okay. The other reason that I hesitated and procrastinated to teach on divine order in the church because there's a lot of nuance in this, a lot of nuance. There's a lot of energy and time required to make sure, I want to make sure when I teach on this that it's balanced, okay, because I, I really... I have a fear of God in me that, that we, we could create this, you know, we could further perpetuate abusive authority. Not, not that there's any threat of that here. I don't believe that at all. But I just was really like, okay, there's a lot of nuance. The, the timing's bad. I just, Lord, I don't want to do this. That was another reason. But I just kept feeling like, Lord, this is the time to share this right now. And I do believe that part of this exposure of the of the wolves and sheep's clothing in the church is because God is on the move to, to establish divine order in his house. It's of utmost importance. It's of utmost importance that we have divine order in God's house. Utmost importance. So I can say to you right now with a clear conscience, honestly before God, that I do not have any selfish motives to teach about divine order in the church. I am doing this Truly, truly to help you. Because I believe that most of the church doesn't really understand this. And because they don't understand it from Scripture, that they're, you know, they can easily be in rebellion to the Lord and not even know it. Okay? So that's the approach I'm taking here, if you can hear my heart, is, is God, you know, if, if we are in rebellion to the leadership and the governance God has placed one under, we can claim that, oh, I'm submitted to Christ, not to man. But in reality, in reality, we are actually in rebellion to God because God has established authority in the church. God has established a structure of authority in the church and to not be in submission to the God-ordained authority in the church is actually to be in rebellion against God. Now, again, there's nuance there. Because if the elders are abusive and the elders are leading you astray, then God does not require you to be submitted to them. But, if, but you know, there's, a whole, there's a whole balance here we could get into. But 
assuming that you have God appointed, Holy Spirit led elders, and I do believe we have that here, I genuinely believe that, then, then it is important that we come into that submission to the leadership God has placed you under. Okay, those caveats hopefully will make some under, uh, give you some understanding. Um, what I did, what, most of what I'm going to teach on today came from just me learning the hard way about divine order in the church. And I've shared before when I first, you know, when I first, you know, just you're, you're 25, you think you're God's gift to creation, you think you're the anointed Messiah, you're little Christ version two or whatever. You know, when you're 25, you just think, you, you just think you're way better than you actually are. And so all of us think, you know, think you're, you know, when you're young like that, you think you can conquer the world and change the world and your dad knows nothing. And so, you know, you're, you're coming in and God says, serve your dad in ministry. And you're like, I don't, I know more than him. I could do it better than him. I'm just being honest with you. And you know, I'm more, I'm more, have more of anointing, whatever. I just, just, and I learned the hard way. No, he is an amazing leader. And I was totally out of alignment. Okay. When God started to correct me, showing me how out of order I was as a leader. Okay. He led me through about a six month to a year process of deep repentance. And I realized I was dead wrong. <laughs> and, you know, two books that really helped me, if you're interested to learn more, Watchman Nee's book, Spiritual Authority, though I don't agree with everything Watchman Nee said. So it's in, in that book. I don't agree with everything he said. I don't agree with everything in that book. I'm just saying, but God used that book in my life. And John Bevere's book, Honors Reward. Both of those books really led me to a place of deep, deep repentance. And in that time of repentance, the Lord was really showing me, your nature is more like the fallen angel Lucifer than like Christ. Because, I mean, really, that's like, dang. I mean, for real, for real. I was more satanic in terms of my nature because I was in rebellion to God's authority than I was to like Christ, all right? I had, and, and when God started showing me my pride and my rebellion and my independence, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, really brought me to a place of deep repentance. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. It doesn't matter how much you think you can hear God's voice. It doesn't matter how great you can teach or preach or lead or whatever it would be. If you're out of divine order, if you're not into alignment with the authority structures God has in your life, you're operating in illegitimate authority. Make that, let, let that sink in. If you're not, I don't care of your gifting. I don't care if you can prophesy and you read people's minds and hearts. I don't care if you can flow in words of knowledge and you can teach like the Apostle Paul. If you're not submitted to God's authority in your life, you're operating in illegitimate authority. And we can look at that in 1 Samuel 15 where, where the prophet Samuel told Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And insubordination or stubbornness is like idolatry. So for, for me, I, I'm, when I was not under the authority in the way I should have been, my ministry was in rebellion to God's divine order, and my ministry that came out of it was almost like it was witchcraft. I mean, that's what the scripture says. That, that's, just, that's a sobering, sobering thing. True ministry comes through the Elijah-Elisha model. You, you serve another's ministry, and then through that ministry, God gives you your own. Like Jesus said, how can you have your own thing when you will not serve the ministry or when you will not serve that which is another? True ministry does not come off in this rogue thing where I'm going to go off and I'm going to exercise my own will, not having under, not having any authority. That's witchcraft. That's illegitimate authority. And the Lord showed me that and corrected me. I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, forgive me. That's my story, okay? So I say that to say I'm, I'm teaching today out of experience, all right? I'm teaching today out of lessons learned the hard way, okay? And through much repentance over a, about a year period, I came under to dad's authority. And once I did come under dad's authority as a pastor back then, I realized, 
wow, what a man of God he is. <laughs> what an incredible man of God he is. What an incredible teacher he is. Uh, just a man of godly character. Um, just, I, I mean, just one of the rare gems in the body of Christ, truly. Even though he's not, like, really popular. He's popular in Africa, but no one here knows him. But in Africa, he goes there, he's like, he's like daddy. What do they call you, papa or daddy or dad? Yeah, yeah. I, I used to think that was, like, spiritual father, but it means you're old. But, <laughs> yeah. I, I say sometimes when we, go to, when we go to Kenya, when we land in Kenya, I was like, you know, they could really name the airport after dad. Because, I mean, he's, like, so... I'm serious. He's had such an influence in Kenya and in Africa and just really God's used him in such a way. And I was so wrong to have that proud, presumptuous attitude in my heart. And anyway, sorry, I've repented already, but sorry. <clears throat> You're awesome. Okay. Now let's get into the scripture. Now let's get into, let's, let's walk through the scriptures. And I just want to go through verse by verse here talking about what does the Bible say about church government through elders? Let's look now at Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 is, we'll, we'll kind of go through that verse by verse, is Paul told Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete, he's talking to Titus, that you would set in order, did you catch that? That you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Notice carefully the connection between order and elders. Elders bring in God's divine order. Without having the, the proper governance and the proper authority structure in the church, what would, be, what would there be? Absolute chaos. Absolute chaos. That's, what, that's why Paul was saying, go and set in order in Crete the, all that remains in the churches by establishing and appointing elders. Now, in, in, verse, in, in verse 5, in verse 5, Titus had to do this so, that that, so the local churches in the city would be spiritually healthy, well-governed, and they would grow in maturity and sound doctrine. Now, verse 7 says this, and he says the overseer, he's, he's talking here about, he's still talking about the elders in context. For Titus 1.7 says, For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. And I really want to highlight the word steward. The elders are stewards. The church does not belong to the elders. It belongs to Christ. The people do not belong to the elders. It belongs to Christ. I hear this all the time. I hear this often. Let me say it like this. I hear it often that people will say, you know, just some famous name. Let's just imagine for a minute I'm famous. And they say, oh, that's Brian Kessler's church. It's not Brian Kessler's church. It's the Lord's church. We're just stewards. Well, and sometimes pastors will get up and say, well, our people. I hate that. And if I say that, sometimes it can just slip out of your mouth, but that is so wrong for a leader to get up and say, well, our people. And I hear it sometimes between pastors and pastors talking and it's like, well, our people and our church. It's like, Listen, it's not your church. I'm, I'm saying it to you, you guys, like I'm imagining like your elders or pastors, but I would say to the pastors, to pastors, to leaders, it's not your church, and these are not your people. You're a steward. They're not yours. They're the Lord's. It's his church and his people. The elders are, get, are, are given a stewardship to oversee by the Lord's instruction. That, this is not... Brian, Ken, and Randall's church. It's the Lord's church. You're not our people. You're the Lord's people. We're stewarding what God is, has given us. Does that make sense? Very, very important. I think it's repulsive. I think it's just repulsive to say, 
This, well, for a pastor to say, well, my church or my people. Now, I said that, and now I'm probably going to slip up sometime in a casual moment and say, well, my church and our people. I, I don't mean that from my heart. I might just, that's not my heart. I might just accidentally say that. I, God help me if I do. That's repulsive. 1 Timothy 1.9 says, to hold fast the faithful word. This is what an elder is called to do is to hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Okay, so the elder must be skilled in the, in the word of God. The elder must be able to refute those who contradict and must be able to exhort those in sound, sound doctrine. So elders must be able to, to, to teach the scriptures and and things like that, and, and refute those who are in error. Okay, now let's flip over to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. As we continue walking through what Scripture teaches about elders in the church, Acts 20, verse 17, and uh, as you're turning there, just to set the context of that passage, is what was happening was Paul was, he, he went to Ephesus, and he gathered together into Ephesus the elders, and he said to the elders, so, it, so in, in saying to the elders, you can see the role of the elders in action. He said to the elders, he said, be on guard for yourselves, okay? The elder must be able to govern himself first. There is no leadership until there's leadership of self. So the elder must be able to govern themselves first, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. So there's a, there's a guarding element related to eldership. Okay, there's a guarding element related to eldership. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Okay, who has made the elders overseers? The Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure there's many cases where the ones appointed to eldership was not by the Holy Spirit, but by man. And so that's a, a very different conversation. But I'm convinced in my heart that the elders that are here at this church were, were made elders by the Holy Spirit. And they were, what, what's their role? To be overseers. Not to control, not to be authoritarian, not to lord it over to oversee, to oversee, to shepherd. Now, he says next, to shepherd the church of God. And the elders, not everyone who is an elder can necessarily have the fivefold gift of being a pastor. They could be a, they could be a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher, an apostle, but... No matter what your main function is as a leader, it's imperative that every single elder carries the Lord Jesus Christ's shepherd's heart. That we carry the Lord's shepherd's heart. That we want to shepherd the flock like Jesus shepherds his flock. Because, listen, the elders are going to give an account. This, is, this puts the fear of the Lord in me. It puts the fear of the Lord in Dad and Randall. We are going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ for how we shepherd or led you, whether we did it according to the Lord's heart or we didn't. Okay, so I'm telling you, that puts the fear of the Lord into me. That means, God, I don't want to say anything or do anything that is not by the Spirit of God. Because I'm going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ. I do not say that lightly. I say it in the fear of God, and may the fear of the Lord increase for us in that. But to, to shepherd, when, we, when, the, when the scriptures talk about shepherding, and this is what the, the role of the, the, the elders is to be, we're to be shepherds. We might, we not, my, my, I'm, I'm definitely not a five-fold pastor. I would be more of a teacher, prophetic then I would be uh, a like a five-fold pastor. But 
we, you, you must carry, whoever's in leadership must carry the Lord's shepherd's heart. So that, that's the culture we're trying to establish as elders. Is we want to carry, we want to, we want to have the shepherd's heart of Jesus Christ. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're definitely fallible. We don't do it perfectly. We're trying our best. But uh, in terms of shepherding is to shepherd the church means, here's, here's what it means to sh- be a shepherd in the church. It's to care for spiritual needs. That would mean teaching sound doctrine, correcting false doctrine, making sure, you know, making sure in services everything's flowing in divine order. That means if, if you know, things are going on in different ways that we're making sure everything is done in divine order and bringing things into alignment with the mission and vision and making sure your spiritual needs are met and making sure you're, you're growing in Christ and all those kinds of things. The second thing a shepherd is meant to do is to protect the flock is to be on guard, to be overseers to, uh, against any negative influence that would try to come into the church. Like that's what Paul was warning about is he was warning is he was saying, after I leave, there's going to be some people who come in and they're going to speak perverted things. It doesn't mean like, you know, we think perverted, we think sexually immoral. That's not what he was talking about. He was saying they're going to speak some twisted things. They're going to speak some things that are deceptive to you, and it's going to cause you to get off the straight and the narrow way, and it's going to cause you to get off the mission God has you on, and that twist, that subtle twisting is going to draw them to themselves. And the elders are to guard to make sure that the flock is not deceived by those kinds of influences. Okay? It's kind of like with your kids. (laughs) You know? Anna's looking at me like, don't tell Anna's story. I'm not going to tell Anna's story. But just, it's like with your kids. Actually, she was, (laughs) never mind. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It's like with your kids. Okay, you better not say that about my kid. All right? That's the way we feel, I believe, as elders. Okay, you better not (laughs) come into this flock and bring your stuff in here and influence people in a way that is contrary to the gospel. <laughs> so we, we take that serious as shepherds. We're guarding the flock. We are guarding the flock. Hey, Kate and Caleb, how are y'all? I mean, Kate and Lily. Caleb and Lily, sorry. Y'all are awesome. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the shepherds are meant to protect the flock, to guard the flock. Number three, the, the, the shepherds are called to guide and to lead. Leadership in the church is servant leadership. It's not lording it over you. It's not authoritarian. It's not uh, dominion or control. Leadership in the church, Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus said, if you want to be a leader... You must become the servant of all. If you want to be a leader, you must become the slave of everyone. And I hear sometimes people talking about, well, I just want to go into ministry. I'm like, why? Why in the world would you ever want a ministry? (laughs) I mean, you are basically, you're the target of the devil. You're the floor people walk on. I'm not, not you guys, but I mean, sometimes some people can. You know, but, you know, it, it, is, it is rough business, okay? It is, some, it is intense. So if you think God has a call on your life in a ministry, do everything you can to get out of it, okay? Some advice to you. Do everything you can to get out of it because it's rough. I mean, Michael knows. He was a pastor for many years, still is, and it's tough business, man. It's tough, it, you know? I can't even imagine just, you know, if you were in a larger church, just the, the pressure you face and that kind of stuff. But leaders, the, the elders are meant to be leaders not by lording it over, but by serving. The elders are meant to be leaders not by saying do this, but by setting the example, saying this is the way we live. Now model the way we live. So if there's not the fruit in one's family and house and home and character and life, if you don't see good fruit, the fruit, good fruit in someone's life, that's part of the requirements of being an elder, then I would not follow anyone that you look at their life, they can preach incredible, but inwardly you're like, their character is off. Their character is not of alignment. 
Jesus said you will know them by their fruit, not by their gifts. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by the character of Christ. Do they carry the character of Christ? Okay, not perfectly. We do not carry the character of Christ perfectly, all right? We are trying just like you are trying, but... We, we, are, we are going after God as hard as we can. We make mistakes. We, we fail. We honestly, we're definitely fallible men for sure. And our, our point is this, is that we are not, the, the, the goal, the, the shepherd is meant to be an example, not to lord it over you. Number four, pastoral care. And Much of the pastoral care at Restoration Life has been delegated to house church leaders. And the house church leaders, and and, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish a culture. Again, we do not do this perfectly, um, but we are are trying our very best and want to do better to provide pastoral care that flows down into all the house churches. And so the house church leaders are providing pastoral care to their house church groups because, you know, we have house church on the last Sunday of the month. And they're the ones who are, who are, who are the primary responsibility to take, you know, to take care of people in their trials, to visit the sick, counsel, help resolve conflicts. And one of the main reasons we had to do that is because I, you know, I think that's the biblical model, by the way. You know, I think the traditional model that I grew up in in a denominational church, that traditional model says the pastor does everything. That's not biblical. That's the, that's the recipe for burnout. The biblical model is to equip and train and, and, and so the house church leaders become the pastors and they take care. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we don't do it. We do it also, but it's just, a, it's just the way that I believe is the biblical model of pastoring a local congregation is to be delegated through that. And the other reason is because I also have to work part-time. So if I tried to like teach and pastor every single need, there's no way I could do it and take care of my family and be mentally sane. So that, now some people will question if I'm, no, I'm kidding, but that's why we've delegated and we said the house church leaders are the pastors, that they, they're doing the pastoral functions. We're doing them as well, but that's the kind of the flow or the structure that we have in this church. And then number five, the, the shepherding involves equipping the saints. Ephesians chapter five, equipping the saints for the work of ministry so that we would come into unity See, part of being a a shepherd and part of being an elder is to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of faith. To to preserve the unity of of the Spirit. I'm saying it wrong. Mom mom quotes this all the time. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The the elders are meant to to guard the body because remember, the body is the very body of Christ and we are guarding the body to see that this, the church is in unity and we're, we're, we're equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Now, back to Acts chapter 20, 20, Paul told the elders, he said, you are to shepherd the flock of God that has been purchased with the blood of Christ. That's serious to me. That when we shepherd in terms of the accountability to God, is we are shepherding his blood-bought children. They are not our people. You are not our people. I mean, we're friends and all that, but you're the Lord's people. We are shepherding his blood-bought children, okay? That is some serious stuff. I can't even imagine to take the platform and the authority that God would give you as a leader and use it for selfish purposes to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and to say, you use this platform given to you to abuse my people and to exert your own agenda. I can't even imagine. That would be horrifying. God, help us. And, and back to that, back to that verse, Paul said that, Paul said, um, Back in that verse, he said this. Let me just read it. Acts 20, he said, verse, he said, I think it's verse probably 28. Yeah. 
I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. They will come from among your, your own selves. Men will arise speaking perverse things. Again, that does not mean like, you know, we think it perverted. That's not what it means. But it's like twisting the truth to lead someone astray. Where, where is it twisting them the truth and leading them astray? It's twisting the truth and leading them away from Christ and what God's doing corporately, okay? What God is doing in this hour is not individual. It's corporate. He's working through his body, not independently. So what, what Paul's saying is they're going to come in, instead of, instead of work, uh, worried about the body, they're going to come in independently. They're going to twist things and then they're going to draw them after themselves. And Paul said, elders, you're on guard. You're on guard to watch for that particular dynamic in your church. Okay, does that make sense? All right, now, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Paul said, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Let me tell you what this does not mean. This does not mean to rule with an iron fist at all. It means to lead. It means to lead like Jesus, servant-hearted leadership, sacrificial leadership laying your life down for the sheep. It does not mean to have a rod of iron and say, thus saith the Lord, and you must follow me. That is not the leadership that, that Paul is talking about. It is leading like Jesus Christ. And the, the double honor does not mean, I, I saw uh, my youngest brother Stephen sent us a, a video this week of some apostle just opened a building and they were like, you know, he was welcoming him in like the president had just come in. I'm like, that's so terrible. <laughs> that's so disgusting. Like, that's not the honor Paul has in mind here. Double honor does not mean when me, dad, or Randall walk in, you're blowing your horns and you're laying up a little red carpet so we can come to our first seat. And, you know, all, that's not what, that is not what is meant here. Okay. If you ever call me Pastor Brian, I'm going to give you what the teenagers call the evil side eye, okay? We're not into titles. We're not into any of those kinds of things. I don't think the, the scriptures are like that at all, okay? It's not like blowing the horn and announcing, okay, the apostle has just come. That is just repulsive. I hate that stuff. I hate that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's not, I don't believe that's what Paul's talking about. But there is, there is the place for the elders to, that those who work hard at preaching and teaching to have double honors. This is, this, see, this is really awkward for me, but it's, it's really awkward. It's like telling your wife, hey, submit to me. I'm just saying this is awkward. I'd rather teach this at another church. But it is important. It is important to show elders double honor. Okay. All right, got really silent there. That's fine. Verse 19, Paul said, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Okay, this does not, okay, this is, this is where the nuance comes in. This is where abusive leaders have used the scripture when people were calling out legitimate spiritual abuse to say, hey, you cannot call, you can't raise an accusation against an elder. That's not what Paul said. He said you cannot do it except if you have two or three witnesses. Because what Paul was doing and what Paul was putting in place is he was putting in place, because Paul knew this as a leader, as a leader you become the target and the bullseye of the devil's accusations. So what happens is, is, let me tell you this in case these thoughts have come into your mind, is what happens when you're a leader is the devil will start putting these thoughts into your mind about the leader saying, well, he's this, or he's that, or he does this, or he does that. Because 
The devil knows that if he can get you to agree with his accusations against a leader, then it can cause you to be not receive what they're saying to, to hinder your own spiritual growth and to actually bring disunity into the body. And so Paul is saying, Paul is saying, listen, if there's accusations coming against an elder, you must have two or three witnesses to prove your case, else you must be quiet. That is not meant to be a, a safeguard for abusers. It's meant to be a safeguard because Paul realized that leaders are the target of the devil. And it's so easy for the devil to come in with his accusations against those leaders to try to bring them down and stop the mission of the church. So Paul was saying, do not bring, um, do not bring an accusation against an elder except if you have two or three witnesses. He was basically, this is the reason why he was doing it, because Paul was knowing, he knew that sometimes... What sometimes what can happen is people can become hasty in their judgments and they can call someone who won't repent or call someone who has offense in their heart. He can call someone to come into alignment with their offense and therefore cause that person to join in with the offended person and then come into the plan of the enemy to bring or to accuse that leader. See, he's saying here, he's saying that, that listen, be aware that if there's accusations... All right? Again, this is not a, a, a covering for abuse. But be aware that if someone is offended or someone will not repent in certain areas, that they can come with accusations against leadership. And it's very easy if you're not discerning to, come, to begin to agree with that accusation, not having the full story. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, you need two or three witnesses to bring up an accusation against an elder. And if there are two or three witnesses, in the case of Mike Bickle, just for example, I'm just using Mike Bickle. For the case of Mike Bickle, where there were not just two or three, there were multiple stories of accusation. And the problem was their leadership, their, their leadership model was totally unbiblical, and therefore there was no accountability. So... But when there is the biblical model of eldership and governance, that if accusations come up and there's two or three witnesses, then you should definitely come to the elders and bring it to their, their attention so they can deal with those things. And if it's them who are doing it, to hopefully lead them to repentance. So it's not saying this is not a safeguard for abuse at all, but there is a biblical precedent to deal with accusations against leaders. Does that make sense? All right, so now... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. We'll, we'll, just read, uh, we'll just read a couple of verses here. We won't go through the whole thing. But uh, verses 1 and 2, Peter was talking to the elders, and he himself was addressing them as your fellow elder. And he was telling the elders, he was saying, shepherd the flock of God among you. Again, you get the theme of the elders are shepherds. And we, I listed those five things that, that elders do. They shepherd the flock of God among you. Exercising oversight. So again, the theme comes through. Shepherds who exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. In other words, don't be in leadership if you have any selfish motive. Don't be in leadership if you have something in your, in your soul that has, is broken, uh, like you need the praises of men. The, the worst place in the world, if you need the affirmation and praises of men, the worst thing in the world for you to do is be a pastor. <laughs> because sometimes God might actually call you to be a pastor to, draw, to kill that very need in your heart. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> most, most of the time, y'all are awesome, but I'm saying. Just, just, just the history we've got. Yeah, you know what? If you're a pastor, you're like, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay, this phrase, lording over, uh, let's look at verse 3. Not as lording it over, those allotted to your charge, but pr proving to be examples of the flock. Again, I, I just mentioned this earlier. We're not, elders are not to be lording over. Elders are not to be domineering or controlling. You know, if, if you're aware of what happened in the uh, discipleship shepherding movement, I don't know, back in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, if you're, if you're aware of that, you saw when people took this 
form of eldership to an absolute unbiblical, uh, unbiblical grounds to where, you know, Derek Prince was a part of that, but he repented of it, even though of Derek Prince. He repented of it, and what it had gotten to was they had taken the oversight of elders to the degree where if you wanted to buy a new car, you had to come to the elders and ask for permission. If you wanted to get a new house, you had to ask for the elders for permission. That is not, that is completely, totally unbiblical, okay? I do not care where you get a car, just as long as you help buy me one, okay? So just... Get a car wherever you want to get a car. So, okay, that, that is not what I'm talking about. And sometimes, you know, we, you, you experience that negative experience of that, and it swings the pendulum all the other way to here. And, you know, we got to come to that right biblical balance here uh, of what that means. So that, again, again, he says that the, the, the people under your leadership, they are allotted to you by God. In other words, there is a sacred trust in leadership. And what I mean by that is God as leaders puts the people he's placed into a body and he, he says to the leaders, you have a sacred trust to watch over them, not lord it over them, not control them, not be domineering over them, but to be their shepherd. That's the biblical role there. <clears throat> to lead by example. Now we'll, we'll look at now Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. And this will be the last scripture we look at today. Hebrews 13, verse 17. It says, and I'm just going to make this one disclaimer. This is, makes me feel very uncomfortable. This is very uncomfortable for me to say this. But it says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Okay, I'm going to put some context and some nuance here, Okay. Obey your leaders and submit to them. And in the context of this is talking about the elders. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. Okay, so let me just bring balance to this. This is not a husband coming to a wife and saying, woman, submit to me. Okay, I am not coming here and saying, church, flock, Brian's people, <laughs> submit to me. That is not what I'm saying. This is the way I believe, the, this is the way that I think the biblical structure works. It's very similar to marriage. Where in marriage, Paul said right before, he said, he said wives, submit to your husbands. A few verses earlier, he said, he, said, you, he said, submit to one another. He's talking about the body. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ. There's, in, in marriage, there is mutual submission. There's mutual submission in marriage, but the husband must assume that role to be the laying down their life leader, the sacrificial leader for the wife and the family, and then to love the wife like Christ loves the church. If there is not first the husband taking that role of Christ-like leadership in the marriage, then, there, then Paul's teaching would, would need to be understood. Now, Paul, let me say it this way. Paul's teaching about why submit to your husbands is in the context of the assumption that the husband is leading in that sacrificial way. Okay? The, the author of Hebrews is coming and he's saying, obey your leaders and, to, and submit to them is writing under the assumption that the leadership is truly serving Christ, truly being an example of Christ, truly serving like Christ, serving in a sacrificial way, being true shepherds after the Lord's heart. This does not apply to abusive leadership situations. It's under the assumption that the leaders that God has placed you under are truly leaders who are following the heart of Christ. Does that make sense? It's not, this does not mean blind obedience where you just throw away your critical thinking skills and you, and you throw away your discernment and you throw away and you just blindly say, no, I need, you see, you see how this can be abused. It can be greatly abused. So, so the, uh, Hebrews is not saying blindly throw away your critical thinking that red flag feeling you get in your spirit or that, that sensing that something's off here. 
He's saying, you know, don't, don't throw that out. He's saying, he's saying, but assuming you have these leaders and they've met the criteria, we won't get into the criteria today, the criteria of eldership in, in Timothy and Titus, they've met that criteria, being above reproach, the husband of one wife, and their house is in order, and he's, he's you, know, not, you know, not drinking wine or much wine, all those different requirements of being an elder, assuming those things are in place, then then, the, then Hebrews says, obey and submit to your leaders. And there's a place in here, it's like, it's like in, in marriage where Paul said, the hus, you know, submit, wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. So the wife submits to her husband, but it, but it comes after he is demonstrating Christ-likeness and demonstrating laying his life down and sacrificial love and loving her like Christ loved the church. Then the wife is called to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. In other words, it's an honoring of God's authority structure in marriage and thus an act of worship to God. And that same principle is at work in the church, is the obedience and the submission to church elders assuming they're the right shepherds, is as unto the Lord. Does that make sense? It's honoring God's governing authority in the church and, and, and obeying what they say, not blindly. And if they're saying anything, listen, if we ever say anything God's not saying to do, do not obey or submit to us. If we ever contradict Scripture, do not obey or submit to us. Okay, if we, if we say anything that is off track by scripture, do not do what we say, okay? We're, this is under the assumption that they're, they're leading you in the Christ-like way. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Now, this, let me skip over this last page here. Submit to them implies a posture of humility and cooperation. This is very important here. Trusting in God. This is why it's so important when you're figuring out, okay, Lord, where should I go to church? You don't just, it's not like house hunters when you're trying to like, okay, well, here's my criteria for a house. And therefore, I'm going to try to find a church based on these criteria. And I'm going to, you know, it's like, like house hunting on TV. That's not how you find a church. You find a church by the Holy Spirit. You find a church by God saying, you go here. He places the members into his body as he desires. And so if God has placed you in a certain church, you should not go to anywhere unless God has placed you there, even here. If God has placed you there in this church by the leading of the Spirit, you feel like hey, this is where we're supposed to be, then there is also in that time that you trust in God's sovereignty in, in the leadership he's placed you under that you will come into uh, a posture of humility and cooperation with the leader's, the leader's guidance. That makes sense? Because they keep watch over your soul. This is what Hebrews says. They keep watch over your soul, and you, they will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, listen to what this says for you. All right, this is what we have. Okay, we got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, before the eyes of fire. Okay, that's the case. Listen to your part. <laughs> let them do this. Let us, the elders, do this with joy and not with grief. That word grief is like, a, it means a sigh. It's like, uh. that's what that word in, in the Greek means. It's like, see, leading a church, you can experience the joy, which is the majority of the things we experience in church. But there's sometimes those times where you feel that, that sigh like, uh. Now, that's kind of what that Greek word means there. So the exhortation <laughs> to the church is to do it so it's a joy to the leaders, to the elders, and not where they're like sighing like, oh. That's what Paul said. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. And so 
the, just, just to close this up, the big picture is we are a body. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and Jesus Christ is the head of this church. We as his body, we are not coming to a church service. We're not coming to a two-hour service. We're not coming to an event. We're not coming to, church is not really some place you go. Church is, is the people who are gathered together, who come under the headship of Jesus Christ to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and to grow together in him as one body. It's a body. It's not about an individual. It's not about an individual ministry. It's not about this independent thing here and here. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Even, even reading um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the gifts of the Spirit begin to flow, you can see very clearly Paul has in mind not what we've seen in the charismatic church and the charismania of the charismatic church for so many years where it has nothing to do with the local body. It mainly is about the prophet being recognized because he has a word of knowledge or something and everyone's like, wow, look at that gift. No, the gifts of the Spirit are for the growing of that local body to come fully together corporately under the headship of Jesus Christ so that we can together express his life together organically. Okay, so if you just, we say it all the time, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. When you gather, each one has a word or a prophecy or a scripture or, you, you know, we don't just come together as a spectator. We're coming together to hear what the Lord is saying. So please hear when we're saying divine order. We're not saying you can't hear from God. We're saying please hear from God. But there's divine order in how we execute it. But please go and hear from God. I love it when the body hears from God, hears from the Lord. Even this week, you know, two people, two people gave me a word, uh, or gave me and dad a word, and it was the exact same word. Be strong and courageous. It was like, wow, okay. Someone on like Tuesday and someone on Friday or something like that. Just don't talk to each other. Don't even know each other. So I love the beauty of that, where, where the gifts of the Spirit flow like that. But it's meant for the body. It's not to build up an individual's ministry. Does that make sense? Okay. So just to bring this, this message to a close, divine order is very important. It's very important that we come under divine order to the Lordship of Jesus Christ first, divine order as it, to the spirit-led life, spirit first, soul second, body third. We don't live based on how we feel or think or what we want. We are, um, we're living by the spirit. Christ first, the spirit second. Then from that place, as the husband and wife, both are doing this together. Now I know there's nuance here. Through that, the husband and wife come into divine order where the husband is serving, Christ, serving the, the wife and laying down his life like Christ laid down his life for the church. And there's submission to the husband and that leadership. That then flows to parenting and that the, the, the relationship with children and parents. That then flows down to the church through elders who are God's governing structure in the local church to bring divine order. That then also flows into the civil government and all those things. But just to say this in closing... Divine order is essential. Divine order is essential for God to have what he wants. Okay, so I want to just pray for us as we end that the Lord would, would, would show us very, very clearly any area in our hearts where we're not in order. Okay, so just, just remember this. God gave us I think five dreams, one prophetic word about divine order. Terry Bennett didn't know any of that. I didn't share any of that with him. He comes and he gives a message on Saturday morning and he mentions, I think, divine order 24 or 26 times. Okay, the Lord is, is very, very much speaking to us right now, divine order, divine order. And there's a reason why he says that, right? He doesn't just... 
say, well, okay, there's not much to talk about right now. Why don't we give him the topic of divine order? No, there's a reason why we need this. Lord, show us what, where we're off in divine order. So I just want us to pray that. I want to pray that right now for us. Father, we just come right now and we, we ask you, Lord, that you would reveal to us, God. Lord, reveal to us. I pray, reveal to us where we are not in divine order. Lord, reveal to us where anything is out of alignment with your heart, with your leadership. God, with your order of government, whether it's in the church, whether it's in marriage and parenting, in our own individual lives, in the, the civil, in the community. Lord, would you reveal to us, Lord, any area where we are not into alignment with you, Lord? And would you highlight that to us so that we can see, God, that we can see any area where we are not in alignment with you? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the online portion here. And then maybe Drew and Bethany, could you come up and just lead us? In, I won't, we're going to do something in a second, but just um, maybe lead us in a worship song.